Job, a man with godly character. And I know Job had his issues. He had his problems. The Bible reveals some of his failures. And um, an entire book's written on him. God thought it important that we learn from him, uh, from his triumphs and his trials, and along with his tribulations, and also along with his victories and the blessings of God. As we consider the matter, all of us have our ups, all of us have our downs. It's a matter of how we deal with them and be able to move forward. And Job was one of those men that was able to uh, overcome the trials that he had and the sufferings. And uh, God used him and blessed him in a wonderful way. I'm sure that even as Job's friends accused him and uh, thought that he was a sinner above measure, that he had secret sin and other issues in his life, I'm sure so it is today that when we as God's people battle certain trials and certain issues, there are those that uh, probably are ready to throw rocks at us if the truth be known. But I'm glad that if God be for us, and who can be against us? And uh, God's on our side. I'm, that's a true statement. But the main thing is I'm on God's side. He'll fight our battles. As we consider the matter, Job, a man with godly character, uh, we looked in verse number one, that there was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. And again, we've said this, I don't be too overly redundant, but it's one thing for us to say that people are people of integrity or for people to speak of themselves, but in this case, it's God that said it. And if God says that Job was a godly man and he was a, lad, a man that had some character and integrity about him and spoke well of him in the scripture, then you can mark it down. Uh, he was a godly man, a good man, and he had character for God to speak this highly of him. And so we found that he was a man with a perfect heart, not perfection, uh, not just maturity, but a man that was uh, upright. He was a man that was complete. He was a man that uh, had a complete moral uh, standard about him, a moral excellence, if you please. Uh, he was upright, he was straight, he was honest, he was a plumb line. God could use him as a plumb line to uh, measure how straight others were. And I often use an illustration if I'm soul winning and trying to lead somebody to the Lord, where the Bible says that uh, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Uh, God uses himself as a measuring stick, as the standard. You know, if, if I measure myself against you or you measure yourself against me, we're both going to come up crooked because uh, we're all uh, sinners. Thank God we've been saved. Our sins have been forgiven. We're going to heaven. Uh, but we'll not reach the uh, state of perfection until we go on to be with the Lord in the eternal state of our existence and uh, after death. But as we consider the matter, I tell them, God measures you and I to himself. And when God measures all of us up to himself, we all come up on the short end. Uh, it's like taking a speck of dust and trying to measure it against this wall. There's no comparison. And so that's the way it is in the scripture. So he was a man with a perfect heart. He set the uh, standard or the example. He was upright. And then we seen that he had a prestigious honor. God uh, said that of him. And we found what the Bible had to say about honor. Now this morning for about five minutes, I want to give you just a brief thought on another thing that I see in here. In fact, the Bible speaks of it on three different times. And we'll read each verse uh, so that we can get its context. In verse number one, uh, God starts off by saying there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God. Now watch the last thing that God says of him. In this particular passage of scripture, he says, and he and eschewed evil. Now look with me, if you would please, in verse number eight. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man? And here's that statement again. It's almost a repeat of verse number one. He's a perfect and upright man. He's one that feareth God and the Bible said, "Assureth evil. And so we find that word, "Assureth evil, found in verse number one of chapter one, then also in verse number eight. Then if you go with me over to chapter number two and verse number three, and the Lord said unto Satan, now he's speaking to Satan, hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect man, an upright man, and one that feareth God. And here is a repeat of that statement again. And then we find that he says, and Eschewth evil. And so while we found that Job had a perfect heart, he had a prestigious honor, we also find that he had a practical holiness in this passage of scripture. He was one that eschewed evil. And the word eschewth, if you look it up in the Strong's and the context and where it's used here, in fact, these are the only places where it's used in the Bible in reference to Job, it literally means to turn off, to leave, to remove, to turn away from. And so 
the definition of it is when it said that he was one that issueth evil. It, what it literally means is, is that Job, because of his holiness, he was one that was able to leave ungodliness, unrighteousness. He was able to remove that from his life. And so it carries with it not a perfection that it never was there, but it carries with it the thought that once it's there, you're able to remove it, to take it out of your life, to run from it, to uh, flee from it. And that's according to the definitions and the strongs. But then when you go to the Webster 1828 dictionary, Noel Webster said it literally means to flee from or to avoid. And so we find that if Job is going to take and remove sin from his life, he's one that issueth evil, he is able to turn away from, he's fleeing from it, he is removing it and uh, trying to turn it off. And that means that he was confronted with it. And there were things that Job had in his life that he had to remove from his life in order to maintain a practical holiness. I preached a message, it's been a few weeks back, uh, before a surgery on holiness. And it's the first time I'd ever uh, preached on the subject. I'm not sure if the Lord will ever give me liberty to preach on it again. I've been studying it off and on for some time. And uh, of course, an uh, individual sermon does not give you the time to expose an entire uh, study on the subject matter. But when I preached it, God gave great liberty. And I was thinking about holiness that God demands us to be holy. He said on numerous occasions in the Bible, be ye holy as I am holy, saith the Lord. Now here's the thing. Some people I've heard Christians say, especially those that have struggled with particular sins and weaknesses and areas of their life that have said, preacher, I've tried and tried and tried uh, to get that out of my life and I just can't do it. Well, when we make those statements, we're making God a liar because God said, be ye holy. God would never command that we be holy and remove sin out of our life it was not, if it was not capable. Uh, all, Paul said, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. And we've got to understand that we're in the flesh. And as a result of that, we're going to struggle with the flesh. I don't care who it is in this devotion this morning or who's listening live streaming, we're all going to struggle in certain areas of our life. There's going to be areas, and this is where opinions get people in trouble because they, their opinions are usually on their strengths. And so they use themselves as a plumb line to judge everyone else. Now, I'm not talking about policies, procedures, and uh, certain ethics. I'm just talking about when it comes to opinions and judgment. The, usually opinions are based on the strengths of that individual. Most of the time, people don't give an opinion based upon how sorry or low down or how uh, corrupt their mind and heart is. It's typically on their streets. And so sometimes people will have a higher opinion of themselves than they should have. Other times people have a lower opinion uh, concerning their competency and, and competency and things that they have ability to do. And I've heard some say over the years, there's no way I can do that. I've tried and I've tried and I've tried and I've failed and it's just not possible. It's okay for everyone else. They can do it, but I can't do it. When we make those statements, we are making God out to be a liar. Because God said, be you holy as I am holy. And so if God commands it, you can rest assured it is possible. Amen. Thank you for the amens. It's the truth. Uh, God commands it several times in the scripture. We have, my goodness, it's clock's gone. I just happened to glance at it. And that didn't go up. So let me give you two verses of scripture and I'll close and we'll pick it up, uh, Lord willing, next week. First Timothy chapter number six and verse number 11. Be thou, O man of God, or but thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, patience, and meekness. And so he tells, Paul tells young Timothy, that there are some things in his life that he needs to flee. And uh, there are things that are listed previously going into the text. I'll deal with it later. I don't have time this morning. But literally, to be holy, it means there are some things in life we have to flee from. There are things we have to run to, but there are some things we must run from. And so he's saying here that we are to follow after, and we're to flee from the things that are wrong, and then we're to follow after or run toward righteousness, goodness, Godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. And then in James chapter number three and verse number seven and eight, he says, submit yourself therefore to God. And then he says, resist the devil. Again, we're talking about holiness or eschewing evil. It means to remove from, to flee from, to turn from, to turn off, to get away from, to avoid. 
And so he says, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now in this passage of scripture, in 1 Timothy 6, there are some things that God tells you and I that we need to flee from. And in this passage of scripture, he said that if we submit ourselves to God, the devil will flee from us. Now I'd much rather the devil be fleeing from me than me having to flee from uh, things every time I turn around. We sh and it's going to happen. There's going to be sin in our life. There's going to be temptation. There's going to be trials. <clears throat> There's going to be things that come into our life that we must flee from or we will lose our holiness. We become corrupt before God. And we're going to have to do that consistently because we're in the flesh. We're human. But I thank God that it's not just us running from sin. We can live so holy and godly and righteous before God that the devil flees from us Amen. and runs from us and Amen. says, I want nothing to do with him. And as we consider the matter, he said, draw nigh unto God and he will draw nigh unto you. You know why he flees from us? Because God's in us. God has power. God has control. And Satan says, I don't want to touch him or her because they've got God all over them. The Bible said he'll resist them and flee from them. Amen. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And so my time's up this morning. Not only do we find that Job had a, a perfect heart and a pure heart and a prestigious honor, we find that he had a practical holiness. And you know, some people are so holy. Um, <laughs> all right. Yeah. You ever met anybody that's so holy that... Um, they're so, as the old saying goes, so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. It's impossible to get to that state. I don't endorse that statement. Uh, but, you know, some people, they think more highly than they ought to think. And I've said this before. We're in a service, and I've got to close, honestly. But I uh, was in the service. It's been a few years back now. And uh, people started standing up and testifying. I have no problem with that. I'm glad for testimonies. In fact, I encourage it. And uh, sometimes even here we'll have testimonies. I might even uh, get testimonies this afternoon. Uh, but um, was in the service and a couple people stood up and this lady stood up and she said, I thank God I'm holy and I thank God this and I'm this. And it was never about what God was doing. It's always about uh, this, I this, I that, I this, I that. It's all about her. And I thought this has got to be the holiest, godless woman I've ever been in the service with my whole life, been around. I turned and looked and I snapped my head back around. Yeah. I would even allow... Uh, if I was her husband, I wouldn't even allow her out of the house to be dressed the way she was, much less go to the house of God. And the, the Holy Ghost of God was nowhere even close to this woman. Yeah. You say, you can judge that? Then no way yeah. a woman can dress that loose in public, especially in the house of God, and God be all over her. Right. Hey. Now, somebody on YouTube can shout loud enough amen so we can hear you all the way here in Cleveland, Tennessee. Because I ain't backing up. Amen. We need to be holy, separated from the world. The problem today we have um, is we're just tagging along and keeping our distance from the world. The world is not our standard bearer that God is. Amen. And we keep ourselves uh, close to God, drawing on to God. He shall be drawn. He shall draw out. As we move closer to God, God moves closer to us. And God said, Now be ye holy, for I am holy, saith the Lord. And he puts his signature on it. He doesn't just say, Be ye holy, so I'm holy. He puts his signature, he signs it. He said, For I am the Lord. God says, I'm putting my name on it. I command you to be holy. Well, give us a course, if you would, Brother Devin. <laughs>